Hello there, beautiful friends. Here's some Buttigieg, Pete, Pete Buttigieg. An unwavering beacon of hope with the sincerity and principles we need to lead this country towards the end of this sentence. Hi, please show this video to your parents, who are statistically more likely to support Pete than people younger than his age, 38 recently, happy birthday, Judge Pete. Anyway, statistically, show this to your parents. Hi parents, thanks for watching. I hear you might be checking out this Pete guy as an alternative to like a, like a Joe Biden type. To quote this older gentleman from an article about Pete fans, I like Joe, but I don't want Joe to be president. I think we just need new leadership. I really feel that very strongly. Obama was a new year and transformational, and I think we need that. Now, we've already talked about how Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. is the perfect candidate to primary Donald Trump for the Republican nomination and save the soul of America like he says he wants to do and bring the Trumpist party back to reality, but also about how he's had his hand in a lot of pretty bad decisions and policies that have brought us to where we are today and is a part of the political establishment America rejected when they elected Donald Trump and nobody wants two sundowning old men arguing over who's handsier with women. So maybe his candidacy would actually be a disaster and nobody actually wants it, so please drop out, Joe drop out Joe but anyway Pete a fresh face Obama 2.0 hope 2.0 high hope we don't need to do the dance we don't need to show you this you better vote Pete you better act now, a leader like this only once comes around. Mayor Pete is coming to town. But we did. Anyway, what were we? Right, a person talking about how, sure, Joe Biden is a bad candidate for lots of reasons, but how so is Pete for lots of reasons. The Pete appeal among an older demographic seems to stem from this idea that He's like a boomer's ideal version of a millennial. You know, he's such, he's, su he's such a nice young man. Quite the resume. In a similar way, Bernie Sanders is a millennial's ideal version of a boomer. You know, quite the, quite the let's aggressively fix all of the messes we created. It's the difference between being young and being youthful, basically. It's well illustrated in this moment of pure art from a Buttigieg advertisement of Pete speaking out loud for the purposes of recording and releasing an advertisement for people to see. I believe we should move to make college affordable for everybody. There are some voices saying, well, that, that doesn't count unless you go even further, unless it's free even for, for the kids and millionaires. But I only want to make promises that we can keep. Look, what I'm proposing is, is plenty bold. Plenty bold. So imagine a younger person who is aware of the overwhelming number and diversity of effects of climate change, of crushing student debt, stagnant wages during increasing productivity, all the wars we do for no reason, a healthcare system dependent on an insurance industry built on profit. So anyway, you're that person and you know those things. And here's my plan for it. And my plan is, well, it's, it's plenty bold. Now, we'll come back to this ad and how Pete talks or lies, if you prefer, but another really good example of the difference between Joe Biden but younger and young people is this other piece of pure art, a Profiles in Courage award-winning essay for the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library lauding Bernie Sanders' boldness and consistency of principle and ability to unite both parties to get things done by an 18-year-old Pete Buttigieg. It's a glowing review that also chides other politicians for drifting to the center and focus testing. It's adorable, and maybe we'll return to it when specific quotes are relevant to what Pete does and says later. But for now, back to you, the parents. Hi, I get it. As a woman in that article explains with a shrug, I am ready to have somebody young. Creepy, but all right. This says it all, really. It's not about his amazing plans or ideas or experience or leadership skills. It's about his aesthetic. This idea of what a president should be. Here's Mandy Moore explaining exactly what I'm talking about. He's, he's a veteran, he's brilliant, he's a Rhodes Scholar, he speaks seven languages, he's compassionate, he's authentic, he's, he's a real 
human. I don't know, I, I feel like that's a quality that's often overlooked in a presidential candidate. Um, He's such a nice, smart young man. He seems like a president, I guess. Or at least he's got the resume of a president. He seems to have always wanted to be one. In his John F. Kennedy Presidential Library essay about how cool Bernie Sanders is, Pete ends it by saying, I commend Bernie Sanders for giving me an answer to those who say American young people see politics as a cesspool of corruption, beyond redemption. I have heard that no sensible young person today would want to give his or her life to public service. I can personally assure you, this is untrue. Considering he's currently running to be the youngest president ever, I don't think it's unfair to characterize this as an ambitious young man who probably already wanted to be like a president someday. Give his life to politics and public service. So the nice young president boy began to build that resume. He went to Harvard and graduated magna deafening jizz. He worked on some campaigns, learned a language or two. Right out of college, Pete worked for the Cohen Group a strategic consulting firm founded in 2001 by former United States Secretary of Defense William S. Cohen. He helped a few more campaigns, another degree at Oxford thanks to a Rhodes Scholarship, Mr. President, a couple more languages, and then he ended up at McKinsey and Company in 2007, where, I'm going to editorialize a bit here, he learned how to lie. <laughs> McKinsey & Company is a multi-billion dollar management consulting firm formed in 1926. According to a 2004 article in The Independent by Ben Chu, McKinsey's fingerprints can be found at the scene of some of the most spectacular corporate and financial debacles of recent decades. Enron comes to mind before Pete worked there, and ICE comes to mind after Pete worked there. They've assisted Saudi Arabia in cracking down on dissidents. They do all kinds of stuff that's all in service of the public. Sorry, profit. Profit. And the bottom line. Reuters describes these incidents and other practices as indicating not bad apples, but a culture of corruption. Now, according to the Washington Post, a review of speeches and interviews that Buttigieg gave when he first pursued public office in Indiana shows that he consistently played up his McKinsey experience, touting work advising senior decision makers and claiming he was part of billion dollar decisions made by Fortune 500 companies. But by the time his presidential campaign began, you wouldn't even know he ever worked there for more than three years. However, after continued pressure by people who were like, but you want to be the president. What did you do while you were at that bad company? He has released some details and former clients. Pete, always the humble one in the room of 38-year-olds trying to be president of the United States of America, downplays his work, saying, to the extent that I was uniquely qualified on something, it was definitely Canadian grocery prices. Speaking of Canadian grocery prices, the company Buttigieg is referring to is Loblaw, a Canadian grocer implicated in a price-fixing scandal to coordinate with competitors and artificially raise the price of bread. This was brought up recently by the New York Times editorial board. You've been on the front lines of corporate downsizing. You've been on the front lines of corporate price fixing. You've been on the front whoa, lines whoa, whoa. That's, that's, of, our, that's, of our misadventures. I'm sorry. That's, of our mis what? That's, I mean, what? That's... I'm, First of all, you gotta get better at pretending to be indignant there, buddy. Also, can we quickly imagine Pete going up against Donald Trump? On the front whoa, 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 that's, that's, of, that's, our, that's, of our misadventures. I, I'm sorry, that's, of our mis Do we have a clip of our imagination? That's what it is. Cool. Anyway, after catching himself downplaying the scandal and correcting himself because he knows the board wouldn't let it fly. So the proposition that I've been on front lines of corporate price fixing is just to get that out of the way. You um, worked for a company that was fixing bread prices. Uh, no. I worked for a consulting company that had a client that may have been involved in fixing, or was apparently in a scandal. I was not aware of the Canadian uh, bread pricing scandal until last night. He doesn't address the downsizing that was mentioned, or the general issue of what McKinsey does, as opposed to his involvement in one specific scandal. He goes on to talk about how he understands problems with American capitalism, and how just because he doesn't seem emotive at times, he would not be doing any of this if he weren't propelled by passion, or Bernie Sanders or whatever. Speaking of things Pete's written, I'm just going to read you a passage from Pete's memoir. A memoir, you're like 37, Pete. Anyway, here's a guy who sees the problems in American capitalism generally, writing about the price of food. I was learning about the nature of data, 
By manipulating millions of data points, I could weave stories about possible futures and gather insights on which ideas were good or bad. I could simulate millions of shoppers going up and down the aisles of thousands of stores, and in my mind, I pictured their habits shifting as a well-placed price cut subtly changed their perceptions of our clients as a better place to shop. Now, to be fair, he did say price cuts, so that says nothing about coordinating with competitors to artificially raise the price of bread. But to be balanced, that Reuters article about the culture of corruption at McKinsey, published a year after Pete left McKinsey, explains the reason you hire McKinsey is that its consultants have seen strategic business issues like yours before, and therefore might have developed good insights into how to approach them. But the reason they're familiar with those issues is that they've been given highly confidential information about your competitors. So when you hire McKinsey, you're essentially trying to acquire, for a very high hourly fee, the kind of corporate intelligence that can only be built up through long exposure to highly sensitive commercial information. Now, it's unclear what Pete's actual role was with the bread pricing, or if McKinsey was even involved in that particular scandal, unlike the other scandals in which McKinsey was involved. But whether or not his work led to the price fixing, McKinsey the company is maybe one of those problems with American capitalism that Pete's so aware of, but he never addresses that. It's not about specifically what Pete did while working there, but that he worked there. Because like I said, he believably denies being involved in the price fixing. The front well, well, that's, that's, of our, that's, of our misadventures. I'm sorry, that's, of our misadventures. And it doesn't address the downsizing, which we'll get to. He downplays his role and distances himself from all its corporate scandals, despite it being the corporate scandal company. All that he's really said is, quote, I think they've made a lot of poor choices, especially in the last few years. I left about 10 years ago. But it's really frustrating as somebody who worked there to see some of the decisions they've made. And that's straight up McKinsey talk. Obfuscating the point, selling you something. Their poor choices, which don't reflect who they are or what they do in the last few years, you see. Enron was 2018, you see. To get a little more McKinsey talk, when asked about their work with ICE, McKinsey's managing director, Kevin Sneeder, sent out a memo explaining that McKinsey was not working with ICE to implement its border activities, but simply providing, quote, management consulting services for the agency's Enforcement and Removal Operations Division. He also wrote that the company will not, under any circumstances, engage in any work anywhere in the world that advances or assists policies that are at odds with our values. So good. You weren't helping ICE implement its border activities, but just helping the Enforcement and Removal Operations Division. We're not helping ICE. That would be at odds with our values. We're merely helping ICE. McKinsey is just another language Pete learned to lie to you with, to sell you something worse than what would be good. You can hear this in Look No Further, that Plenty Bold Edge clip. My plan is plenty bold. It's bold enough, okay? Just like, come on guys. It's almost like I'm giving you too much, you know? You've, you've had plenty, so take it. In fact, in regards to joining the rest of the world and providing health care for everyone in the richest nation on earth, I think there's got to be some humility in our policy here. Be humble, says the guy who wants to be the president. We need humility in regards to being humiliated by the rest of the world on this issue. Stop asking for something bolder than plenty. You don't deserve shit. My plan is bold enough. Take the scraps. Pete talks like this whenever he wants to make it clear that in order to achieve Medicare for All, which he totally wants to do, always has and totally still does, and thinks it's the best option that we should do, and in order to do it, we have to not do it yet. I mean, sure. Think about what the president can do to unify a new American majority for some of the boldest things we've attempted in my lifetime. We have an opportunity to do the biggest you, things Mayor. we've done in my lifetime. Sir. But what if, in this bold time for America, we pump the brakes a bit, man? I mean, we already tried universal health care in the f***ing 90s. We should do a, a public option and hope that people like it, and maybe then we can start to think about doing the single payer part. And I'm, I'm actually not here to argue policy, but I will just say that the whole point of universal programs is that everyone gets them. 
And when people like Pete, who take a lot of money from insurance and pharmaceuticals, frame Medicare for All as taking away people's choice, as if employee-dependent insurance in certain networks and bronze, silver, or gold variants on deductibles is a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a choice of freedom, that, that people, people love it. When they frame it about choice, they're playing the private insurance game, laid out plainly here by a former Sitka employee who got tired of doing the wrong thing. Also, offering a public option is actually setting yourself up to fail, Pete, as this former director of Medicare points out very succinctly. I'm a little worried about the public option for a kind of technical reason. Insurance companies want to provide insurance to people that don't need it. That's how they make money. And so anything that can be done to game risk so the that... public option would be used by all the people who really need the insurance yeah, and the if most. Our insurance companies would then try to find ways to have... Uh, People who really need care go to the public option, which would enrich, it would, it would make, it would uh, it'd be a good business case for them, and that's not good for the country. But again, not here for policy. I'm just here for that sweet, sweet McKinsey nonsense. Look, I think it could very well be the long-run destination, but I think there's got to be some humility in our policy here. Uh, let's put this out there and see if it's really the best plan for everybody. I think it will be the best plan, but I'm not willing to assume. Hell yeah! In fact, that plenty bold edge clip? It's about how free college and trade school is bad because we don't want to pay for the children of millionaires to go to college. Now, aside from the fact that, again, universal programs are about everyone paying in and everyone having the option, and also, children of millionaires aren't, like, all clamoring to go to Ohio State, and also, for harping so much on the pay for the kids of millionaires thing, Pete's actual policy on his website, he wants people to read, says, We can make public tuition completely free for over 7 million lower and middle income students who are eligible for federal Pell Grants, including many middle income families with multiple children in college, and for all families earning up to $100,000. I mean, a family earning up to 100 k that's like two salaries, like two teachers? Certainly not actually close to millionaires, the thing he's worried about. So if one of the teachers gets a raise, that's like, that's going to be a gnaw on the college for their kid, or just, it's just a weirdly, clearly dishonest way of Pete to frame this is all. Like, like that seems like a blatant lie is all. Speaking of blatant lies, Pete also worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield and was recently asked by Rachel Maddow if his work there had anything to do with layoffs at the company that took place a couple years later, Buttigieg said, I doubt it, adding, uh, I don't know what happened in, in the time after I, I left. That was in 2007 uh, when they decided to shrink in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I do know is that there are some voices in the Democratic primary right now uh, who are calling for a policy that would uh, eliminate the job of every single American working at every single insurance company in the country. First of all, big difference, Pete, between eliminating jobs so that an insurance company can make money and eliminating jobs so that everyone can go to the doctor. Popping on your McKinsey accent there, Pete. But part B of all, here's Pete four years after the time he left and two years after they decided to shrink. In 2011, on camera, into a microphone, so people can hear him speak. Could mean anything, who knows? Just a weird emerging pattern of seemingly blatant lies. These are just two examples of his work at McKinsey. I could mention his team's suggestions to privatize the post office, the only government agency almost all Americans f***ing love, but whatever. Pete had a gross job where he learned how to talk gross, all right? As a Rhodes Scholar, we've all had to choose between corporate consulting and no other option. But it wasn't all business and corporate intelligence. Pete had time to party, too. Like in 2008, when he went on vacation to visit his friend in Ethiopia, and they decided to take like 10 hours to go to Somaliland for 24 hours, then spent their time there talking to local officials, and then wrote an article in the New York Times promoting America's involvement in Somaliland. All right, let me back up and start our new segment, the Central Intelligence Buttigiegency. So there's a theory out there that Pete is some sort of CIA asset, or like involved with the CIA, or at the very least, weirdly favored by the intelligence community. There's a lot of space between those options,
But there are just a few odd things. And no, it's not just his working at a strategic consulting firm founded by former United States Secretary of Defense William S. Cohen, then one of the world's largest corporate intelligence firms while training to be a naval intelligence officer, then shortly after beginning his term as mayor of South Bend, the Navy Reserves called him up to send him to Afghanistan for seven months in the year we were withdrawing from Afghanistan, and he's also on the board of advisors for the Truman National Security Project, but never talks about that stuff, and this truly weird trip to Somaliland as a vacation for 24 hours. Now, his campaign says he was just, you know, starting at McKinsey and visiting his friend in Ethiopia, and they decided to stop by Somaliland, as one does, for a single day. The friend he was visiting is Nat Myers, the best man at Pete's wedding. Nat is currently at the Office of Transition Initiatives, part of the United States Agency for International Development Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, and was developed to, quote, provide fast, flexible, short-term assistance to take advantage of windows of opportunity to build democracy and peace. It's an interesting phrasing, advantage of windows of opportunity to build democracy. William Bloom describes the USAID as having a close working relationship with the CIA, and agency officers often operated abroad under USAID cover. Foreign Policy and the Associated Press has documented the USAID's history of working with the CIA and their own intelligence operations. According to an AP investigation, in 2010, the USAID launched a social media platform of 40,000 users designed to foment unrest and spark a revolution and the collapse of the communist government of Cuba. This didn't work, of course, though it did allow Havana to gather intelligence on the 40,000 people who used it. Anyway, normal Pete and his normal friend at the USAID, when they were 25, went to Somaliland for a day and talked to local officials and then left and wrote an article for the New York Times about how America should get more involved in Somaliland to help build democracy through opportunity and stuff. Like, I'm sure Pete's not in the CIA. It's just weird, all right? Like, I can't have a little conspiracy fun. It's gotta be all bores with you people, but it's not, it's not that he's in the CIA. It's just that he has a lot of experience of manipulating data and using language and private intelligence to manipulate people, right? It's why he talks the way he does. But whatever, we're moving on. All right, Pete left McKinsey in 2010. He ran for state treasurer and lost. On the campaign trail, while he was going on about all the Fortune 500 companies he helped make money and fire people, he also argued that accepting contributions from banks, political action committees linked to banks, or bank executives would amount to a conflict of interest. And he swore off, or in the latter case, limited such donations to far below the legal limit. Pete seems to have changed his mind about money and politics, though. At a recent event, he was asked by Greg Chung, a student organizer at Iowa Student Action, I wanted to ask if you think that taking big money out of politics includes not taking money off of billionaires and closed-door fundraisers. To which Pete replied, no, and walked away. This is probably because although Pete has sworn off corporate PAC money and pledged to refuse money from executives at fossil fuel companies, The Intercept reports a review of his campaign disclosure records finds that Buttigieg's presidential campaign is awash in cash from bank executives, many of them heavily involved in financing the fossil fuel industry. But no influence. Speaking of influence, it was recently reported by Axios that one of Pete's bundlers, HK Park, dangled influence to donors in an email reading, if you want to get on the campaign's radar now, before he is flooded with donations after winning Iowa and New Hampshire, you can use the link below for donations. Now the campaign's response was, the campaign did not see or authorize the language in this email, fair enough, but it is ridiculous to interpret it as anything more than asking potential supporters who may be interested in Pete to join our campaign before caucusing and voting begins. Get on the campaign's radar now! Is this another way of saying donate to the campaign, you see? H.K. Park previously served as the special assistant to the Defense Department's chief of staff and currently works for the Cohen Group, Pete's old work. Anyway, speaking of simply replying no and walking away, the day before he said taking big money out of politics doesn't include not taking money from billionaires and closed-door fundraisers. After being asked by a student organizer, he was asked at a press conference about his closed-door private fundraisers, something he's been asked about for months, and... And that's a question that reporters have been asking for months now, so I'm wondering when do you expect to be to actually have that conversation and give like an answer on that? Uh, again, I don't have a timeline for you. Okay, as the 
as the candidate, can't you just direct your campaign to open those records? What's that? As the candidate, can't you just direct your campaign to open those records? Yes. And why haven't you done so? What's that? Why haven't you done so yet? Uh, there are a lot of considerations, and I'm thinking about it. Last question. Can you give us an example of those considerations? No. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, Thanks. Now, Pete wasn't always so not so transparent about these closed-door private fundraisers. It seems to have really started after an issue with a, a, a fundraiser. As reported in October by the New York Times, Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign, facing criticism, distanced itself on Friday from a Chicago lawyer who tried to block the release of footage of the 2014 police shooting of a black teenager, Laquan McDonald. The lawyer, Steve Patton, gave $5,600, the legal maximum contribution, to Mr. Buttigieg in June and was scheduled to co-host a fundraiser for him on Friday. After the Associated Press reported on Mr. Patton's involvement, Mr. Buttigieg's campaign said that it would return the money and that Mr. Patton would not attend the fundraiser. Then, those pesky closed-door fundraisers started in full swing. Though, to be fair to Pete, his campaign has since opened doors to fundraisers. Per campaign manager Mike Schmuel, in a continued commitment to transparency, we are announcing today that our campaign will open fundraisers to reporters and will release the names of people raising money for our campaign. Speaking of transparency and releasing the names of people raising money for a campaign, in mid-December, the Buttigieg campaign released a list of his bundlers, the private fundraisers who collect other donors for the candidate, having maxed out their own donations at $5,600 per cycle. The transparent list from the Buttigieg campaign weirdly excluded a bunch of those private fundraisers, like some, some finance guys, some former ambassadors, investors. One of the bundlers seemingly purposefully omitted from Mayor Pete's public disclosure is H. Rajan Cohen, not of the Cohen group, but a lawyer and current senior chairman at Sullivan and Cromwell. During the 2008 financial crisis, he represented Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Fannie Mae, AIG, Wachovia, National City, JP Morgan, and three other banks I didn't recognize. Anyway, the unfairly maligned Wall Street Pete's private fundraiser that he made sure wasn't on his transparent list of private fundraisers had this to say about the financial crisis. I am far from convinced there was something inherently wrong with the system. Now, obviously, a candidate's donors and supporters don't equal the candidate. But it is maybe a bit curious that a defender of so many of the financial sector's crimes and capitalism's flaws is working so hard to raise money for this consulting firm guy who claims to be plenty passionate about the problems facing millennials and younger people while claiming to see the flaws in American capitalism but not wanting you to know that that guy is helping him. But also, hey, you know, we, we, we need all the money we can get. All right. As Pete said back in October, we are going up against the sitting president of the United States. He has tremendous amounts of support and allies at his back, and we're not going to beat him with pocket change. The pocket change he's referring to is the record amount of money from the record amount of donors raised by Bernie Sanders, his hero. Pete doesn't like when people criticize him for taking money from billionaires and bankers and so on, assuming it would contribute to like a, like, like a conflict of interest or something. At a recent debate, everyone was like, you've got all these billionaires donating to you, Pete. Look at all the grotesquely wealthy people supporting your campaign. Why that? Why the closed door wine cave fundraisers? How come? And they compared his high donors to their own low average donor number and so on. Well, on Christmas Eve, Pete's campaign sent out this email about a contest to see who can donate the least amount to the campaign. Just like a fun little game to donate the least amount. Anything to get that donor average deceptively down, huh, Pete? And I don't know, Pete just seems like kind of a f***ing major liar who cares more about being president than being president. I don't want to just call him a liar, but I don't know, man. Here he is talking about the Founding Fathers' view on slavery. They were wise enough to realize that they didn't have all the answers and that some things would change. Uh, a good example of this is something like slavery or civil rights. Uh, for, uh, it's a, an embarrassing thing to admit, but the people who wrote the Constitution did not understand that slavery was a bad thing and did not respect civil rights. Uh, and yet they created a framework uh, so that as the generations came to understand that that was important, they could write that into the Constitution too. And like. That ain't true. 
Here are all these quotes about how they knew slavery was bad. And Pete's a history major. So like, probably lying, right? Weirdly ignoring the founding fathers knowing something was bad, but doing it anyway for profit and moneyed interests. Pete, something to think about? Pete. Which I guess brings us to this. You want, you running for president and you want black people to vote for you? That's a downfall. That's not going to happen. I'm not asking for your vote. You ain't going to get it either. Eep. Now, according to this recent piece from the ground in Iowa, Pete fans are baffled that black people don't support him. Quote, he wouldn't project that black lives don't matter. To him, all lives matter. Eep again. Now, there are a lot of factors that go into this, and despite the Pete campaign leaking a memo to the press about a focus group that could indicate older black voters don't like that he's gay, citation needed, it's probably more to do with how he's handled issues of race during his time as mayor and also after, including his handling of the shooting of Eric Logan by a South Bend officer and just his relationship with the police in general, which we'll get to soon. At one rally, a protester asked, what matters about a black life to you? To which Buttigieg replied, the same thing that matters to me about my own. I guess I see what he's trying to say. It just feels a little all lives mattery, you know? Like 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 that person from Iowa said, and like 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 that time in 2015 when Pete was talking about police shootings and he said all lives matter. Although later, he did acknowledge this statement that seems very anodyne and something that nobody could be against actually wound up being used to devalue what the Black Lives Matter movement was telling us. That is the contribution of Black Lives Matter, and it's a reason, since learning about how that phrase was being used to push back on that activism, I've stopped using it in that context. So he will stop using that phrase in the context to push back on activism, which is apparently the context he's aware he used it in? So I guess he'll find a different, perhaps more McKinseyan way to push back on that activism later. But at least Pete has released the Douglas Plan, his plan for black America. His campaign sent it out with hundreds of endorsements, including very specific names cited as endorsements of the plan by black community leaders who, as it turns out, did not endorse the plan and actually had issues with it that weren't addressed, but their names were broadcast anyway. One was adamant about being a Bernie Sanders supporter, so something in common with Pete, and they all pointed out how very clear they were in their correspondence that they did not support, agree with, or like, let alone in endorse Pete's plan. In response to this controversy that nobody seems to bring up to him, like it seems like something he should maybe be asked about in a debate setting but isn't for some reason, but anyway, his campaign responded to this by pointing out that, well, see, everyone included on the list was sent an email in which they could opt out of being on the endorsement list. Gonna, gonna read a little bit from that email. Good afternoon. Thank you for your willingness to publicly support Mayor Pete Buttigieg's Douglas plan. The boldest plan. And it goes into a little bit about the plan. And then it says, if you do not want your name included, please let us know by 4 p.m. Eastern time today. See, that's the power of choice right there. Getting an email to opt out between afternoon and 4 p.m. Literally, his campaign sounds like if an insurance company came inside a cable company. But perhaps Pete's biggest blunder, Jedge, involves the firing of South Bend's black police chief, Daryl Boykins, who the FBI was investigating for recording police officers in order to root out corruption and racism. Pete and his former and current campaign manager, Mike Schmuel, cite the FBI investigation as the reason for the firing, saying that they were told that the only way to avoid an indictment was if Boykins resigned. Although depositions from 2013 show Schmuel making it clear that the FBI made no indication that there would be indictments if Boykins was not let go. They merely wanted the department to adjust their policy. And I guess firing the black police chief and replacing him with two white guys is a way to do that? or a way to say, I'm not asking for your vote. Further deposition from police employee Karen DePape, also fired by Buttigieg, describes racist remarks and a plot by white officers to use Pete's donors to get him to fire Boykins. The thing Pete eventually did. Not many people have heard the recordings, and there's no way to know why Pete ultimately fired Boykins. Although we do know that the reason he gave 
wasn't true. Very uncharacteristic of former Mayor Pete. I say former because that's what he is now, and I think we owe it to him to never call him Mayor Pete again, but rather former Mayor Pete. But to the point, the last day of 2019 was Pete's last day as mayor. He handed out keys to the city. One of those recipients was Bob Urbanski, a big player in South Bend, and a huge donor to Buttigieg's campaign. Urbanski is the donor named, by name, in the tapes as the donor that would be used to get Buttigieg to fire Boykins. And according to Jonathan Larson's reporting at the Young Turks, in 2018, Urbanski backed a campaign loan for the cop who wanted Boykins out. The two other backers of the loan were Buttigieg's lawyer who oversaw the chief's ouster and the lawyer still fighting the release of the tapes. Probably nothing. Probably not yet another example that sort of exemplifies Pete's relationship with money, power, politics, people, and lying. So I guess, parents, right? I'm talking to parents. Pete's full of shit. Young people don't like him because they don't trust him, because he represents everything wrong with politics and quite a lot of the problems that put young people in the situations they're in today. He's an empty vessel, shifting in the wind, depending on where the money is coming from and depending on what his focus groups tell him, abandoning any principles he may have had as he drifts towards the center. I wish there was an essay by a young person about how maybe that's not good. Oh well. He seems to just say whatever he needs to say to win. And that might sound a bit extreme. But I feel like I've given quite a lot of examples of this. Also, a New York Times piece about Pete running for DNC chair back in 2017 quotes Jimmu Green describing an incident where he kept bringing up his attendance at the Women's March as this weird, like, performative feet on the ground aesthetic, when during the march, the other candidates were at a retreat discussing fundraising to keep the DNC alive. After a forum in Houston, Jimmu Green confronted him about it, and to quote her, he looked me in the eye and said, this is a competition. You say whatever you need to say to win. That's when I saw who the real Mayor Pete was. Sorry, I should change that to former Mayor Pete now. Anyway, thanks for watching, parents. If you've gotten anything from this, I hope it's that Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg are bad candidates who will lose and wouldn't do much anyway. If you get anything else from this, I hope it's that former Mayor Pete should be true to himself, drop out and endorse Bernie Sanders. I know you had high, high hopes, but unfortunately, they're not plenty high, high hopes. Anyway, play us out, former Mayor Pete. <laughs>